How you doing, everyone? We're just connecting to a couple of our social media outlets here, so just bear with us. Good to go there, Sean. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, guys. So thanks for logging on there now. So tonight it is about seven top tips uh, to get mortgage ready in 2021. Um, I'm joined tonight with Sean by Sean Cavanagh, who is my financial services manager. Um, Sean has over 20 years experience in the game there now at this stage. Um, he's worked as a mortgage broker. He's worked in the banks. He's he, he's Sean. Will, he's done tons of stuff now at this stage. And then obviously Helena there as well, working with one of the biggest banks in the country, our biggest bank in the country there for I think seventeen odd years. And then she's she's joined our team at the end of last year as well. So between the two guys, they've nearly over forty years experience. Uh, massive, massive. Uh, experience between the two of them and these guys are if they can't get your mortgage no one can and answer the questions that we have here tonight so I suppose we'll just get straight into it guys so obviously the seven top tips a lot of people are obviously making mistakes as well when they're going in for mortgage application to see the property and they go for it straight away so I suppose we want to cut that out and what we want to do is maybe go through the tips which we feel are the best and maybe some of them are in order some of them aren't but these are the seven top tips so we're going to start with establish your budget. Sean, do you want to take that? Yeah, I think the most important thing that I find anyway when I'm speaking to a client, a prospective client coming in, is um, what what to aim for. There's no point looking at a four or five bed house that's costing four or five hundred k if it's a case that it's completely outside your 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 budget. You need to establish what you can afford and um, what price range you can afford, but also secondly, what you can afford with regards to your monthly payment. So, I mean, there's no point you looking for a mortgage that's going to cost you 2,000 euro a month when you've been struggling to save six or seven or 800 euro per month, I suppose, going forward. So, um, so it, it's, a, it's, it's, it's the first thing I recommend anyone do is to sit down and see what's attainable because otherwise you're just going to annoy yourself by looking on that and my home .e, by looking at houses or apartments that you just, just slightly outside your reach. So if you meet with a bank or a mortgage advisor or a broker such as ourselves, we'll sit down, we'll ascertain based on your income, based on your savings, based on a few different things, what you can, uh, can attain, uh, what you can borrow, what options are available. And uh, obviously that you can apply that to your next search. So when you go in, you can actually start in searching in certain areas for certain um or certain property prices and that region. And that's usually the best way to start because again, otherwise you're you're looking at things that are are just maybe just outside your budget and you'd just be more frustrated in the process than anything else. Okay. Um Helena, do you have anything there to add? Not not on the like on the budget side yet yeah, to make sure that you are a hundred percent and you know what your budget is for the house. Because when you go to bid a lot of people are getting carried away with, I suppose, bidding more for a property than they actually have. And then they're trying to, I suppose, overextend themselves. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, we see this a lot, and obviously the auctioneering side and obviously the estate agency side there as well. People go over a budget and then they're they're trying to hit the, the bank of mom and dad for that extra 20 grand or they're going back to the, um, the bank or the broker and saying, look, I need to get an extra 20 grand, you know, where we're a big thing. And we've said this in the previous videos there as well. You have to establish your budget. You need to know how much you have to spend. And I think that's, it is massive there, guys, all right? So look, we'll, we'll kick on to the next one there as well. Um, getting your deposit together. Helena, do you want to take that? Yeah, like for, for everybody, first time buyers, it's 10% deposit for second time buyers, it's 20% deposit. But I would say to people, like if you have 25,000 euros of a, deposit, of a deposit, you need to also think about the stamp duty and the fees that you're going to have to pay as well for solicitor's fees. Maybe if you're going to get a structural engineer, you need to account for all of this as well into, into your savings. Because like that, again, you have people who have saved the deposit but the banks also need to see evidence that you have the solicitor fees and that you have the stamp duty as well on the side because you need to be able to finish and complete the entire deal. Yeah. And it, it's hard enough to get that deposit together as well. Ah. So, yeah, so like I said, you, you need to make sure. Like, I know there's exemptions out there, guys. Like, would we touch on them? What do you 
think? Yeah, I mean... The, what is an exemption? To... Sorry, first of all, let's simplify it. What is an exemption? Yeah, well, I mean, I suppose an exemption, there's two exemptions mainly. Um, if you're a first-time buyer or a second-time buyer, when it comes to deposit, it's usually a, a second-time buyer needs more than a, a 20%. As a second-time buyer, you should have a 20% deposit under the central bank rules. So, um, But you find a lot of people that they don't have the sufficient equity or they don't have the 20% they need to buy the next property. So if that is the case, um, some people might look for an exemption. So instead of a second-time buyer coming in looking to buy again, instead of them having to put a 20% deposit, they, they they look for an exemption where they only have to put 10% down. So effectively, it's the same deal as, as a first-time buyer was actually getting on that side of things. Um, just to follow up on the deposit rate, I think you did a very good video a couple of weeks ago that any first-timer out there who is struggling to get a deposit, um, one of the first videos we did here is that Ray did an excellent video as these are the five, six, seven things that you need to do in order to get your deposit. And a lot of it's kind of staying at home or watching what you're spending or doing X, Y, Z. So I suppose anyone who's interested in looking at that, um, one of the first videos we did, if you want to scroll back on our Facebook page and have a look at the videos there, Ray did an excellent video then as in his top seven tips there to actually get your mortgage deposit together. I, th I thought it was actually very good. Yeah, you, ha you have to live a disciplined uh, life if you're going to be buying a property and save up that deposit. And um, a lot of people think they can continue going on, but the bank are going to look through your records. And um, again, you're going to touch on maybe these points down on the next one here as well. But the banks are going to go look at every single thing there. So you have to make sure that you have, I suppose, I mean, this is, kicks into the, the next one, Sean, and maybe you can kick into this one, the repayment capacity every month to pay for that mortgage. You, you might be on 150 grand a year, but if you're spending 170 grand, the bank look at that, you know? It's 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 one, it's one of the biggest things that, that we find here that I suppose if someone's going to be declining the mortgage in, in 2021, usually the main reason is that there isn't sufficient repayment capacity. And what does that mean? I suppose you have to show the bank that you can afford the mortgage you're asking for. So um, again, as we said before, regular savings, regular if you're paying money in rent every month you need to be able to show that so if the mortgage you're asking for is going to cost 1200 euro or 1300 euro per month and um, you need to be able to show that you're saving or you're you're renting or a combination of both in excess of that every month because other one is i mean for people that are coming in that don't can't show that and I've, I've had a couple of examples where someone's still paying their rent in cash and they can afford it but they just can't show the bank they can't demonstrate to the bank that they can afford it um you know that that's a huge thing so um it, it makes my job as an advisor as someone who's kind of fighting your corner with the banks and saying listen these guys are great they can afford this no problem um if you can show that listen their savings for the last six months we've saved every month there's no issues no problems we're, we're running our accounts properly and um, it makes my job 10 times easier um, if you have the capacity now i would actually encourage people to save a little bit more than than the, the, the minimum payment because what the banks actually do they apply called what's called a stress test so instead of cal calculating your your payment at today's interest rate which might be 1200 they'll add an extra one percent or two percent onto it so to, to afford a mortgage of 1200 you might need to show them 1400 or 1500 so i would normally say to people save as much as you can don't throw a rope around your neck and leave your current account short or anything like that but um just just save as much as you can and show the bank that you know come the first mortgage payment or the second mortgage payment or particularly around christmas or birthdays or holidays you can still afford to pay the loan well normally phone through christmas or have, have normal things at holidays and things like yeah that. consistency is a big thing there i'd say helena as well you can't be yeah. saving a thousand quid one month and 1500 the next month and 800 the next month and two grand the next month the bank's no, to see that. consistency is key but for anybody who is thinking and, and they're not sure on where to look at the repayment capacity or how to even set up their bank account i mean you could just give us a call and we will run through it very quickly with them it is all about kind of managing your current account, making sure that everything is established well, that there's no referral fees, that you're you're not, you know, running up a big credit card debt, that, you, you know, you need to kind of have everything set, that it looks, that the bank wants to lend to you, that you are actually showing that you can afford this, constantly being in an overdraft facility or um, just unpaid direct debits maybe the money didn't come in on time or you were lodging the money late things like that all go against you so it's it's important to have all of these kind of boxed off make sure that you know when those direct debits are due that you have the money there if you're not doing that properly that structure it better maybe get the the utilities company or whoever you have a direct debit with to change the date so it suits you better as well and and do all that sit down and do a plan i know um i know i think sean has a, has a has a 
an Excel spreadsheet for a plan like that that he, we can send on to people as well. So it's it's very important to do a plan out and know where you're at. Yeah, I remember we had people there before over the years as well that you know they were arguing with us saying, "Look, I'm saving my twelve hundred euros every month," but you're kind of saying, "Yeah, but you're spending five hundred euros on your credit card every month on you know you're not." you're not living within your means you know what i mean and it's a bit i think it's a bad it's a huge thing especially the video like sean touched on that i did there you have to live within your means and you have to still save your money because the bank are going to turn around and say doesn't matter what happens in your life you know what i mean you still have to pay your mortgage every month you know what i mean and if interest rates go up you still have to pay it you know what i mean so which is good as well okay guys sorry go on Sorry, I'm not like I'm not saying to people don't have a credit card, but what I would say to people is if credit cards are fine, but pay them off. Don't leave a balance, a large balance sitting on them constantly. It's costing you more. So you yeah. need to be able to live within your means. And if you structure it properly, and like I said, you can give us a call and we'll run through it with you very quickly as well. And just 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 on the credit card, guys, it's it's not usually advisable to be near your limit. And um, if your limit is two grand or three grand, your credit card. Don't be at two nine or two eight. Try keep it not fifty percent, but don't don't be touching your limit honestly because it might it might be interpreted by the bank as someone if you're a bit stressed or you know if you're if you're always close to your limit, you're not clearing it, you're only paying your minimum balance every month. It it, it it kind of it gives signals out to the bank that you're you're kind of not really on top of your finances. So uh, just a quick tip. So if you do have a large balance there, try bring it down to you're not hundred quid or two hundred quid off off the maximum. In the I, I don't know what you're feeling on this is I've never had a credit card in my life. So like I said, uh, I never believed in it now, to be honest, like, you know, so spend the money that you have, end of story. And um, like, this is going back from when I was 18, 19, 20. So we're not just talking about now, like I've never had a credit card. So I, I when I hear people, oh, I'm only a thousand euros, I'm, stop spending it because you don't obviously have the money. Yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah. uh, use your debit card. And, Simple as that, you know. So right, I, I'm I'm old enough now where we we you had, but if you had to go on holiday and hire a car now, you needed a credit card instead of like, using debit cards and things. So. <laughs> you just have to remember that the credit card limit is not is not a target. Basically. Yeah, yeah. No, well, but, people, yeah. but people treat no, it as a target. Right. And, and credit cards can can actually go against you for mortgage applications. If like even I, I I've dealt with people that have fifteen grand credit card limits. And even if they don't owe anything on on on, on the card, uh, the bank is saying, "Well, this guy will max this law, this this credit card out tomorrow, and have four or five hundred as a minimum payment every month." So just because even the limit was fifteen grand, which isn't even being used, um, that maybe caused a problem. Now, not with every bank, but some banks are, are you know, they, they 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 take that seriously. So I think you're right, right? If, if you can if you can not have a credit card, it, it even looks better. Yeah. And I think if you're saving for a mortgage, and especially if you're on a budget there, you don't want to be spending extra money that you don't have that you have to, and if you don't repay it, you're absolutely getting rolled on the interest rate uh, payments every month there as well. So, so as we're going to point four here as well, um, get yourself mortgage ready. I suppose we'll, yeah. we'll do you on this one, Helena. Yeah, so I kind of already clicked on it. Referral charges, maxing out your credit card, overdrawn balances on your current account. Don't leave a constant overdrawn balance there. And if you're on a subsidy payment from your employer, you, the bank are not going to take that into account because they're going to look at the longevity of your employer over time to see if they're currently on a subsidy payment from the government, can they actually sustain themselves on their own? So there's there's a lot to to be done when you are looking at getting a mortgage to make sure you're in that space in order to get it keeping your bank accounts in reasonable condition okay um what what's the biggest thing that people are getting turned down on i know you touched on that at the beginning there sean maybe um well uh, in addition to not being able to show you can afford the mortgage uh, bad credit is is another huge thing so we would normally recommend before even comes anyone comes in and talks to us um it's free. You can go and get a credit check on yourself now. It used to cost six, seven, or six or seven euro up until a couple of years ago. There's two institutions now you can get a free credit check. One is through the well, What was a credit check? So I'm, I'm Joe Blogs there. I'm going to apply for my first. What does a credit check mean? Like I'm just a normal Joe Blogs. Yeah, What's yeah. I mean, the, the, the bank, I mean, I suppose it's coming from a day where banks now lend to each other's customers the whole time. Back in the day, you needed to have an account two years or three years even to qualify for a mortgage with any bank. Those days are long gone. Like, I mean, you can bank with KBC and have a mortgage permit to ESB and have a credit card with Ulster Bank or whatever. So you can have multiple accounts. So I suppose as, as a result of all that, the bank use a central credit system where they check to see your, your credit profile. So when you apply for a mortgage, 
um, the first thing they'll do is run a credit check on you to see if you've ever missed any payments or had any late payments or maxed out any credit cards or problems or any 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 uh, you know charges against you with regards to bad debt in the past. Um, so, and like for example, so to cut across, just to make it simplify it, so if someone goes into Harvey Norman or something, buys a big flash TV and gets it on the, the tick or gets it on a, a loan or whatever, yeah. and they're 19 years of age and whatever, and then, you know what, when they were 22, they said, I'm going to go to Australia for the year. And, you know, pardon my language, feck the loan, da, 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 da. that goes with you. It does, it does. And I suppose it stays with you from, for five years. It doesn't matter years that it's only years. 500 quid debt. It doesn't matter. Yeah. It doesn't matter. I've, I've, I've now, I mean, I suppose we need to argue the case as in, listen, the guy was 21. It was an Xbox he bought and he forgot to pay it. It was only 40 quid a month, whatever, you know, but if you can't manage a 40 quid repayment and you're asking the bank for a 1200 quid repayment for a mortgage, I know they're not the same thing. And it, it sounds a bit silly saying that, but the, the lender views this as, come here, if, if someone's willing to walk away for a loan once, they're probably willing to do it again or a second time or a third time. And so... I suppose I think everyone financially is a creature of habit. They get into the, the habit of doing a certain thing, saving regularly or spending regularly or running up credit card bills or borrowing every Christmas or borrowing this. So I, I think, you know, the, the bank wants to understand that you're on top of things, but they also want to look at your history. The six months bank statements you're giving them will only show them your your how you've been good for the last six months. So you could go away and live like a monk for six months and show great, great accounts. But yeah. if you have you haven't been a good boy or a good girl for the last six years or five years. That's something they're going to want to check out as well. So, but as I was saying there, you, you can actually go off and check. You can see the information what the bank is seeing for yourself. You can go to, there's two places, the Irish Credit Bureau, icb.ie, or you can go and request a central credit report. So it's a CCO report from centralbank.ie. You can go in, you register, you request them. They're free. Uh, you have to give some details across your PPS number, your name, address, your details. Um, but they'll post them to you and you'll have them within a week. Uh, and again, if you're concerned about your credit or if there's any issues there, um, get the report done. We'll have a look at it for you. We'll talk you through it. And it's better that we find out about it at the start, because if we go and make an application for you and say, these guys are great, look how what much they say, look how great they are. Um, and the underwriter comes back after three, three days and says to us, oh, they're not that great. Look, they didn't tell you about this. They didn't tell you about this in the last two years. So it just puts us in a difficult position where, you know, they might turn around and say, well, geez, what else are they not saying? What else are they not telling you? You know, so it's better that these things are established at, 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 up front if, if there is a problem. Especially if somebody's had a, mo a mortgage break or a payment break on, on a loan. And especially, look, we could just come, we're currently still in a pandemic, but we're coming out of where a lot of people would have had mortgage breaks and things like that. They will still be looked on. I know the banks are saying that they're not going to look on that you can have a mortgage break and, and you know it's not going to affect you it, it kind of it does banks still look at those things to see if you needed to take a mortgage break whether or not you happen to be un, unemployed for a couple of months because they're looking at your job they're looking at your sustainability so this will all have a knock-on effect okay. and when we when we mean mortgage ready as well and we, we you guys see this the whole time as well people all of a sudden they need to get 30 grand deposits together they get 35 grand together and then what do they do stop saving mm. they stop doing it don't they and yeah. then they think right i'm mortgage ready and i'm going to buy a house after christmas now and they stop for three months they don't realize there when you go say the green on a house it takes another three to four months to be able to yeah. buy Keep, keep, keep doing what you're doing uh keep going as you're going uh it, it, it's an excellent point and something we've come across a few times in the past last last year you know keep it on keep it going for a couple of months you're you're 100 right yeah. yeah for any, anybody who's getting married and saving for a house try and keep Don't the two separate <laughs> well, we didn't want to Don't get into the phone but try and keep the two separate because if you have a savings account with absolutely everything in it and then you start withdrawing for a wedding but before you've even got the house the bank are coming back and going well actually they can't afford the they're, they're using the savings and we're trying to explain well actually they're trying to, they're getting married at the same time although they may be saving a lot more than what they need they still should try and keep them separate have their their mortgage or their mortgage savings account and their their wedding yes. savings account separate <laughs> We, we we did that as well. We got married back in 2012 as well. It's sure you only have the money there for the the wedding, and you're trying to rob Peter to pay Paul. And I remember you paid for the wedding, and then all of us, I was just, and then you're trying to get a few of the presents in, and obviously you're like, do you want do you want a gift? You're like, no, cash, cash, cash. You know what I mean? And so get back in because we were buying a house at the time, and we were the the sale was meant to close before we got married, and it didn't. It rolled over, 
So it was, it was hard failure. So I know exactly what you're saying there. So we'll move on to the next one. Anyway. So, um, Sean, you can take this one. So approval options, shop around. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's I mean, we're brokers um, ourselves. I previously worked for a bank. Uh, Helena previously worked for a bank. So I suppose, um, look, I suppose this is the biggest thing you're likely to buy in your life. Um, it's people will shop around by changing gas providers, electricity providers, car insurers. Um, there's nothing that can save you money every year by, by choosing the right mortgage provider and having that, that mortgage set up for yourself. I did a quote for somebody today and I actually took a note of it here. Um, the difference between the cheapest rate in the market and the most expensive rate in the market at the moment is 2.3 to 4.5%. And on a 250 grand mortgage over 30 years, it was over 300 euro per month by just looking around and seeing what options were available. So, um, so in, instead of instead of maybe just dealing with your own bank, so for all the person, for all they knew, the bank, their own bank they were walking into um, was the most expensive lender. And without checking around, without looking at these details, without looking at what other options were available, um, there was a massive amount of money. I think I worked out for this client earlier on that that 300 quid a month was over 80 grand in interest over the 30 years they were looking for the mortgage. And that's after, that's coming out of their net pay, that's coming out of their pocket, their bank account every month, 80 grand over 30 years. How many holidays is that? How many nights out is that, guys? How many cars is that if you want to buy something? So, um, yeah, as I said, by, by, by well, shopping 80, grand, 80 grand is 160 grand because you're being taxed half your income, you know? So yeah, it's yeah exactly you have to earn 160 grand to get the 80 grand in the first place so um, and as well as that guys it's important to realize that even though the banks are similar and how they look at things they they do have their own criteria in regards to the assessment what they use what they don't take what they don't take so in particular treatment of income and um, what's used what's not taken into consideration if you get bonuses if you have any variable income so like bonuses or overtime and things some banks are very 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 reluctant to take some of that into consideration and other banks are saying yeah well depending on the occupation if it's if it's part and parcel of the job we will take it we will look at it so and when you when you're speaking to two lenders if someone will take it and someone won't take it and you multiply you factor that in by three and a half times or whatever else and um, you could be talking 10 15 20 30 grand of a difference between two mortgage approvals between two different banks and uh, so and that could get you the three bed house rather than the two bed house or that gets you the new house that you're looking at where, where your own bank said oh, we can't afford that we can't get you that and, and the money so and, and, and i think that's what people don't understand they think if they go into bank a or bank b they're going to get the same deal which yeah. they don't normally get in do they no and i, and I think I'll I think as a nation, we're very set in our ways on what bank we deal with, right? I'm my bank with, say, Bank of Ireland, and that's where I have absolutely everything. And I think as a nation, we're starting to change a little bit. In order for you to get the best deal, you really do need to look around because although you might see something with a really good interest rate, the long term on that may not be the best for you. You know, you cut the cost of credit in total, and the cost of credit means exactly what you're going to pay back over the term of the mortgage could be a lot higher with, with, with bank A than it is with bank B. Do you know what I mean? And that's yeah. why shopping around is absolutely so important. And obviously, people in certain jobs, other banks look either more positive or more negatively on them there as well. With and they don't tell you that. Obviously, we know in the inside. If you're obviously a certain civil servant, other banks would obviously give them more money, whereas other banks wouldn't, you know? So, yeah, yeah. So. We, we, we had a couple of examples just before Christmas then um, with regards to, we had, I won't say the lender, but we had a couple of cases declined with a lender and uh, they just weren't in the mindset for doing that particular industry. With regards to what's going on with the pandemic and everything else, they were just like, you know what, we're not really doing that at the moment. Whereas we remade an application somewhere else and within six or seven days, we got the approval for them. So um, yeah. the whole point of dealing with the likes of a broker is that you do have multiple options there um, and we you know if one bank says this and we can't do this we go off and speak to somebody else there for you to keep keep your keep your options open i suppose our bank's lending yeah absolutely yeah yeah we've had several approvals already this week for people that we've spoken to this last week and the week before so um i mean the key thing about the bank is that yes there's more paperwork involved you have to show them you can do it yeah it's, show it's, it's the old show me the holes in your hand show me you can approve this but it's all like, the thing about a bank is you need the paperwork. You need to have your salary search. You need to have your pay slips. You need to have your bank statement. You need to have your savings. If you go to the bank with all that information, all correct and in, in, in play, you're giving yourself the best chance of getting approval. But no, banks are open for business. And sure, you can see what they're making off people there over the 20, 30 years. So they're, they're, they're obviously in the market to, to approve loans. 
Yeah, obviously, we're touching on, on obviously using the benefits of a broker. We're biased, I suppose we are a broker as well, but it's, I suppose it's good advice. Um, the main reason is is if option B or option A doesn't go through, you have obviously option B. Whereas if you walk into the high street branch, your snooker, if they come back and say, oh yeah, we got your loan approval. I know it's 50 grand below what you wanted, but at least with us, we have an option B or option C or option D, you know? Yeah. I think that is that is positive there as well. So I'm just going to recap over these guys, and then we're going to go on to our sixth point. Just keep in mind the time here. So number one, we obviously were saying establish your budget. Number two, we're saying getting your deposit together. Number three, we're talking about repayment capacity. Okay, just because you're earning 100 grand a year doesn't mean you can afford a four grand a month uh, mortgage, or I know that's excessive. Get mortgage ready. Um, get your approval options, speak to a broker, and basically shop around uh, the banks and get the best deal. A broker will do that. Again, <clears throat> do what's the story with fees? Like, why people are scared of using brokers as well, guys, um, because obviously of the high fees that they charge. We don't charge any fees. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Go all right, so how do you make money? Yeah, I mean, I suppose, I mean, some, some brokers charge fees, uh, you know, and, you know, we make money. How we do things is that we don't charge application fees because all the banks that we deal with pay us a commission fee on whatever you're borrowing. So let's say you're looking for 250 grand. But then mortgage. obviously I'm paying extra then on my mortgage compared yeah. to walking into that bank. It's cheaper for a bank to go in and pay us on business that they want to approve rather than opening a branch, having five people in the branch or four people in the branch paying quite light and heat paying uh, electricity cost staff costs to go in and sit there and maybe decline five cases or 10 cases the banks are only paying us on business they want to lend to so it's down to us to package it up and get it all uh, sent across to give you the best approval as possible so they come back and say yes so it's the carrot is there for us to get the approval in place there for you and all the banks we deal with um pay us the same it's one percent of the mortgage that we get charged so for every mortgage that we do say it's the average is two and a half two two hundred and fifty thousand two and a half grand if i do 10 of them a month that's 25 grand why would i charge my client anything if we can make that and we're shopping around and we're providing good advice on the basis because it makes no difference to us which bank you go with we're here looking at the interest rates we're here looking at um, the affordability side of things we're looking at the best fit for what you're looking for at the end of the day so typically that's how we run our business and as i said i've been in a bank and as as helena has as well um, and i've also worked on the broker side and when friends and relatives come into me i'd rather be a broker all day long because i can give what i feel is better advice rather than sitting here saying well i've only one option for you and that's you know take it or leave it you know that, that's and that's we're on, we're in partial as well we don't care yeah. if someone goes with a b c d whatever you know what no. i mean so it's all down to the best option for the client at the end of the day. That's that's yeah. that's what it is. And, and, and people often ask me that. Well, who's the best bank? There's no such thing as the best bank, guys. It's 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 finding the best fit for what you're looking for. And everyone's yeah. a little bit different. And that's 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 the secret here. It's finding the, the closest bank to what you're looking for. Some people want variable rates. Who's most competitive there? Some people want to overpay the loan and get rid of it. Who has flexible options there? Um, you know, some people will will you know the likes if you're a public servant. Some people will work off. Some banks will allow you to go use a salary scale and give you a little bit more money on that basis. So again, that lender might be more flexible and might be able to give you a little bit more than 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 someone else. So it's finding the right fit for our customer. And obviously, that's where we come in. We shop around in a few different places. Brilliant guys. So so now we're after getting our loan approval and this is going on to point six, life assurance or mortgage mortgage protection. Helena, do you want to take that one? It's very it's absolutely essential because you can't draw down your mortgage without your with your life without your life insurance in place. And the thing is at the moment with the pandemic and the possibility of everybody catching COVID, the life com life insurance companies are taking a lot longer to do them. Um anybody if they have had COVID have to wait more more than three months for co for cover to be even assessed purely because the the life cover companies don't want to take that on so it is essential it is something you need the banker our reason the bank are looking for life cover is because they want to know that they are going to get paid if anything happens to you you know and when i mean anything happens to you it's it's the awful thing of, of, of debt unfortunately but the, if they want to make sure that their loan is covered so you have to have that but in fairness, you, 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 you want to have it as well, Helena, because, you know, as a husband or, you know, with a couple of kids, Jesus, if I drop yeah. dead tomorrow, I don't want to be leaving uh, Neve with a uh, big mortgage. You know what I mean? Or it's bad no. enough there that you have to get over for six months or 12 months or however long it takes. 
that you have to start worried about the next month's mortgage repayment, you know? Yeah, like, uh, and it's, it's essential that you actually sit down and go through your options because although, you know, life cover is, is for death, right? There's also critical illness cover. There's, there's other covers there available that'll actually protect you if you're out of work for sickness or, or illness or anything like that. And, it, and if, especially if you have small kids, like I have two small kids, three small, three kids, but two very small ones. And, and like that, you do need to protect them. If I wasn't here tomorrow, my husband would, wouldn't have to make, pay the mortgage because it's cleared and we would have a policy payout so that he is able to take care of the kids and able to look after my family and still work if he wanted to. Yeah, which is vital, to be honest. It, yeah. it's, it's massive there, like, you know, so. And um, it also so. is from the critical illness point of view, right? Um, You know, People, the, the rates for, for cancer now are one in four, right? So it, it, it's so high. Critical illness is, you know, if you ended up sick, what would you do? Would you be able to work? If you weren't able to work, how would you pay for it? And critical illness policies, and that's why anybody's taking out a life policy, I would always say, look at the critical illness side, but do sit down and chat to us and we'll go through it with you. We give you all the options, we give you all the costs around it and try and find out what best fits you. And obviously, some life companies are better than others, Sean, as well. So, um, and that's why it's yeah. important when using a, a broker. Yeah, yeah, um, the, the, it, it's 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 not exactly the same. I mean, for, if you're looking for something very, very basic, such as mortgage protection or life insurance only, where you just cover death. I mean, death is death. I mean, you're dead. Your death, I suppose, it pays out. But anything that requires a little bit more talk with a bit more cover, and um, particularly as Helena already mentioned there, the likes of um, specified illness or a critical illness, um, one company will only cover 40 illnesses where another company will cover 60 illnesses and they could be the same price. So how do you know you're dealing with the right company who'll give you that those 20 illnesses more? Uh, there's other features and benefits there. It's not costing anymore. So it's getting advice with regards to what am I getting? What am I covered for? Um, and as I said, you're, I'd say you're more likely to be sick in the next 30 years than you are to die. So the, the illness cover and the, the income protection, whatever else, is probably stuff you're going to need more than, than death. I mean, it's important to look after the death and it's required for your mortgage, all right. Um, but it, it's, it's what I say to my clients anyway, is establishing that safety net. If something happened, what's your plan B? Genuinely, what is your plan B? Oh, I have savings there. Well, how long will that last you? Oh, well, my mom and dad can help out. Yeah, for, for a little while. But what happens after six months, 12 months, 18 months? You can't go back to work. There's an illness there. So it's just putting a safety net in place. You don't have to spend the fortune. Um, and people will be surprised at how, much, how little life cover can cost when you're looking at just to establish a safety net or a plan B there. When you look at what you're paying on Spotify or paying for a coffee every day or whatever else, in comparison to these little things, 20 or 30 quid, may get you an awful lot of cover. It may, it may not be millions in cover, but a little bit of cover is better than nothing in our opinion here. So it's it's, it's, it's having that safety net, which is very, very, very important. Yeah, just a question came in there. Um, do you have to have a medical to get life insurance or income protection? Uh, it depends, usually not. Uh, what they normally do first for your life insurance is they will ask you to fill in an application form. So they'll ask you your height, weight, and there'll be some life and health, uh, lifestyle and health questions with regards to, um, you know, if, <laughs> if you're bungee jumping, jumping every weekend or skydiving every weekend, that's something they probably want to know about. Uh, if you, you know, if you, if you have dangerous or, or hazardous pastimes, like, you know, that's obviously something you want to know about. But if you have a family history of cancer or, you know, as I said, you've had medical issues before, that's normally identified in the application form and usually i'd say 50 percent of the time it's a doctor's report that's needed but in this day and age and the reason why we have it on the list here tonight is because we're in a pandemic guys so um you know doctors are busy doing other things at the moment so if you're applying for a mortgage and you have somebody you know you need, you need a life insurance policy and you have something there in the background you need to get your application for your life insurance as early as possible because these things have to be underwritten what that means is you can be refused life cover, you can be deferred life cover, um, and there's no guarantee that a company has to accept you. So once you've got sale agreed or once you've found the property, it's very, very important that you get your life insurance issued as quickly as possible to see what the options are. Because if they have to write to your doctor to get something clarified, the doctor might take two or three weeks to even reply to them, and that puts you under pressure a little bit straight away. You know? Yeah, which is great there as well. Um, all right, we'll go on to the, the next one there as well. Move quickly. Sean, so be prepared to move quickly. Yeah, um, it's it's something we're seeing more of now in the last few months. Again, with the pandemic and with COVID-19 and everything else that's happening, um, there are people that might have been sale agreed six months ago. 
and they're no longer in a position to buy the house because their financial circumstances have changed. So if what I'm saying to my clients is that if you can step in and say, we have our deposit ready, we're mortgage approved, we're interested, here is our, here is our offer, we're first time buyers, we can move straight away. If you can move quickly, that could be the difference you getting a house or not. And yeah. don't be afraid, like, I mean, it might take six months, it could take 12 months, but sometimes these things can happen quickly. And so don't be, don't be afraid. So I suppose what the, 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 the famous line I use, get all of your ducks in a row, have everything. There's so many things you can't control when it comes to your bid being accepted. You, can, you can't control, uh, obviously, how many people are going to bid against you. You've no control over that. The things you can't control, make sure all that things and everything's lined up. So you're giving yourself the best chance that if you have to move quickly, and that could be the difference of buying somewhere or not buying somewhere. And as, as a first time buyer, sorry, as an estate agent, if I see a first time buyer coming near us and they don't have loan approval, we've no interest in them right now at the moment. We, we're not allowed, okay, right now we're not allowed to do any viewings, but before that, we were only doing viewings with people that were loan approved and we would have to qualify them before they'd be allowed to come into a house. And to be honest, that's not going to be changing. Even if the coronavirus is cured tomorrow when we're back to normal, we will not be allowing people, uh, we're going to keep it this way because it's been successful. We're not going to be going back to open viewings and having 45 people in the house and you know, 42 of them not interested in it. So I think you have to do that. And especially as well, if you're a second time buyer and you're trading up or trading down, um, obviously get us out, you know, we'll value your house. You ne then, because the first question that you, you know, you guys, Helena and Sean and Paul are going to ask are what, uh, how much is your house worth? You know, yeah. so get, get that, like I said, and then go and get your loan approval and then get your house up for sale and then go looking, you know, so it's vitally important. So just to recap there, guys, uh, Sean, when we're recapping, you might just check to make sure there's no questions we missed out of. Yeah. Um, um, uh, yeah. establish, establish your budget is number one. Um, you know, fight, obviously you speak to the guys there, see what's realistic for you. Obviously, make sure you're getting your deposit together or you're saving your deposit. So again, if you're buying a house for 300,000, you need 30,000. If uh, you're a first time buyer, you need 60,000. If you're a second time buyer, plus stamp duty, which is 1%, plus solicitor's fees. If you're a first time buyer, your solicitor's fees will be roughly around two and a half grand. If you're selling and you're buying, um, so if you're trading up or trading down, you have two solicitor's fees because you're selling your house and you're buying your house. So that'd be around five grand, give or take, um, as well. Uh, and plus your stamp duty, plus surveyors, plus, um, plus value as well. Uh, repayment uh, capacity, um, obviously making sure that you can afford uh, the repayment every month. Basically, I think that's simple enough, guys. And uh, getting mortgage ready, basically ready to, to, to put that offer in on a property, getting loan approval, et cetera, et cetera. Shop around. Again, we're obviously use a, bit, a broker. You don't have to use us guys. Use any broker. It doesn't necessarily matter. Like I said, the main thing is I think the best advice is to use a mortgage broker because, like I said, if it's a good mortgage broker, they are going to shop around and get you the best deal in the market, get you the most money. And make it stress free they're always on the phone like at the end of the day they're working for you they're not working for any particular bank you know so i think that's massive and um, life insurance like alina said there you can't get a mortgage unless you have life insurance simple as that the bank want to make sure that you know god forbid if you die your mortgage is paid off so it's as simple as that so the, the bank won't give you a mortgage without life insurance and then obviously Sean touched on there, you have to do this and move quickly. There's no point going out and seeing a house that you love and then all of a sudden you have to go off and get a mortgage. What's what's how long does it take to get a mortgage, guys? So if I went into you today, um I'm a guard or I'm uh, working in a hospital or I'm doing whatever, like you know, and I'm just saying just to take it, I'm not on a COVID payment or you know, I'm a mechanic or whatever it is. How long does it take on average? Um, it, it really comes down to the paperwork, Ray. If you have everything on day one, uh, we would have approval for you probably somewhere within three to six, maybe three to seven working days. Uh, the problem is that if you don't have all your documents and you're coming in and dribs and drabs with pay slips here, bank statements the following weeks, um, credit card statements the next week, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take two, three, four, five weeks to get sorted. Um, we tend to give everybody a checklist from, from the first day and say, listen, if you can come back to me with all this information, we'll have approval for you usually within a week. Typically, they might come back and ask more questions, but we say seven to 10 days to cover ourselves from start to finish. Normally, you'd have a decision, providing we have all the paperwork on hand. 
Okay. There's a question come, come in here, guys. Um, I'd like to know if my husband, who is not a first-time buyer, but I am, uh, could I could I use my first-time buyer option? So she said her husband, so they're obviously married. Uh, yeah, I presume she's referring to the help the buy scheme there as opposed to the first-time first buyer option, um, or maybe not. Um, I well, maybe it's a 10%, is it? It's a 10% thing. If it's a 10%, yeah. Yeah, I mean, both of you have to be first-time buyers, unfortunately, um, in order to qualify. The, the bank view uh, a joint application as, um, uh, as, as yeah, both you need to be first-time buyers, effectively. So um, if, you're, if your husband isn't the first-time buyer and you are, unfortunately, you may need a central bank exemption. Um, now, just something a lot of people aren't aware of, um, guys, uh, the definition of a first-time buyer from the central bank is actually someone who's never had a mortgage before, not someone who's never owned a house. So you might have owned the house, you might have inherited a house, but never had a mortgage. You're still technically a first-time buyer. So a lot of people actually don't know that. Uh, so if you've inherited a man in that house, but you've never had a mortgage, you're still technically a first-time buyer. Yeah, so technically, it does, you don't even have to be a husband and wife as well. So it could be me and Helena who are boyfriend and girlfriend, and all of a sudden, Helena's a first-time buyer. And stop smiling, Helena. So. Sorry, I don't. <laughs> well, Helena, all of a sudden, is a first-time buyer, and I own a property, but we decide to do a joint application. Then Helena is going to be classed as a second-time buyer as well. So it's 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 one or the other. Just another question there that came in there as well. Uh, hi, Ray, Chris here. We're planning to apply for a mortgage next month. Is it a must that both the husband and wife have a full-time permanent job before applying for a mortgage? My wife is doing a full-time permanent job while myself is doing flexible hours uh, with an agency because of childcare. Two kids. Yeah, I, I think flexible hours, I mean, I suppose it, it would depend on, um, Chris, thanks for the question. Uh, it would depend on what the contract is. I mean, flexible hours, do you have a minimum amount of hours that you need to know? We probably need to look at that a little bit more closely. To answer your question, you don't have to have a permanent job. It is probably preferred that you do have a permanent job, but we, we do organize um, mortgages for people who are on contracts the whole time. They would probably want to see the nature of the contract you're on. So if you're, I think they're gone at this stage, but there are a lot of people still aware working zero hour contracts where there was no hours guaranteed every week or every month from the employer. If that is the case, you're probably gonna to struggle to get the mortgage there. Not struggle to get the mortgage, but you're, struggle, you're going to struggle to get the bank to take your income into consideration. They'll take your wife's income, but usually that's not enough to get you across the line. Uh, you probably need both incomes to, to do what you're looking to do there. Um, so it would depend on the nature and if any any minimum amount of hours are guaranteed and how long you're doing the contract. So, uh, Chris, if, if you want to send us an email there, we'd be happy to look into that a little bit more detail there for you based on that. Specific or maybe DM over your um, DM us over your uh, contact information, obviously, and the guys will give you a call on that tomorrow. I think uh, would be the best thing there as well. So, so I think that's it, guys. We, uh, like I said, no other questions. You don't, you can't, you don't have anything else to uh, mention there, do you? Sorry, it doesn't matter. Notice. Two bank accounts to spread my wages over to two a savings account. I should have borrowed down to one bank. Thank you. Um, Pina Clara, great name. Um, Helena, does it matter if there's two bank accounts and spreading my wages over to two? Um, no. Not really. No. no. Once, once the accounts are still in in good order, there's no overdrawn referral charges. Direct debits are all being paid. No, it doesn't. It doesn't matter. I mean, I had somebody else saying to me, "Look, um, I bank with um, AIB, but I have my savings account with Ulster Bank. Should I change it all together?" And I was like, well, "Not really. You don't have to. Um, you once you're saving and you're shown." And you can get your savings, your savings statement, six months savings statement, six months current account statements, and you're showing your savings, and the accounts are in good order. It doesn't matter where you're banking. Every, everybody banks a little bit differently as well, guys. Yeah. Um, people have seven or eight bank accounts, and some people has everything lumped into one account. So, what we try and do is try get at behind how you how you bank, and yeah. we be able to ex we we take that to the lenders and bring it to them and say this is how you organize your finances, this is what you do, and we highlight to them what they should be looking out for. That's how we prepackage, and that's how we get the approval on that. Phase. One Question. thing on that, Sean, is the Revolut account is actually a bank account. A lot yeah. of people seem to think Revolut or N26 are not bank accounts. They are. We do need six months bank statements on them. Okay, just a question for you there. If if I'm getting my wages paid into a bank, I have my savings with the bank, I have everything with that bank, I paid off a car loan with that bank, will I get more money off that bank? 
Oh, I'm no. say that. I was talking no. no, no, shop around. Shop around. Is that the way you're talking about buying since you were 13 years of age and bank account there? Since you, do you know what, right? I've actually no. seen no. I've actually seen people that um, because they've been with a bank 10 years or 15 years, maybe in the last six months they've been good with their money, but the, the previous two years or three years they haven't. And the bank in question know all about that. They have more information on you. They can touch a button. They can see the grading of the account, how much money has gone in and out account for the last five years. Um, and I've seen that actually go against people in the past if they haven't been always 100%. So um, sometimes it can help if you've a lot of, they, they try to help out their existing customers. But generally speaking, if it's very, very tight, it might help. But generally speaking, no, the criteria is fixed. And um, as I said, in certain cases, it could actually go against you if the bank has too much information about, about, about your, your previous um, history, I suppose. Brilliant stuff, guys. Okay, so hopefully that was in, uh, informative to uh, our viewers there tonight. Obviously, we'll save it as a video there for people that couldn't see it as well. We're going to put it up on our LinkedIn and Instagram accounts there as well. Uh, Helena and Sean, thank you very much. The guys can be contacted through our social media by sending uh, DMs or if you want to send in, what's the email, Sean? Info at raycoop.ie. So info at raycoop.ie. That's info amazing. Raycoop. Know that, like, you know? So info at raycoop.ie or just send us a DM, guys, just with your question or your contact details and uh, the guys will get back to you that day or the following day anyway. So brilliant stuff, guys. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Maurice.